Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Thursday. Hope you are doing well today. We are. We're in great moods. Super excited. Yes, we are very excited because we have, as you know, Matthew Ashton on the show today. I'm just, this is so thrilling. Like, I've been actually setting this up in the background for a couple months now. So yeah. I was like really excited to finally see it. Uh, come to fruition. I met him for the first time a few minutes ago. Today's gonna be fun. Yeah, it was a pretty, <laughs> it was a pretty fun. We had a we had a fun mm -hmm. test call earlier today. Who's watching today? Um, uh, wow. Oh yeah. Let's see who's um. Let's see who's in the chat. We have got today. Wow, long list. I know All a right. bunch of people. Alexander sixty eight C is here. Aubrey Kovach. Uh, the uh, Brickanista is here. Hey, Naomi. Uh, Banff Snick Thwip. Uh, Brickaroo Bonsai. Brickworm. Uh, Christopher Separator Guy Chalice is awesome. here. Awesome. <laughs> Debo Bricks. Uh, Deppy Chef Bricks is here. Fabu Fan MKE. How's it going? Hokey Ho Bricks. Bricks. Hi, Eric. Um, Hooded One. Uh, insane Lego Fan. Uh, J Rock 621. Jake Potter. Uh, James, James is here. Wendell. Hey, James Wendell. How's it going? Johnny Cat's here. Hey, Johnny. Uh, Marae just showed up, and Marilyn Parmley, hi, Marilyn. Mini Fig Chick, uh, MJ, hi MJ, uh, Patty Sharon is here, how's it going Patty, Remy Baker, Jake Sadovich is here, how's it going Jake, we'll be seeing you soon, um, The Brick Orphanage, The Hornburgers, Thomas Wheaton, WGJL Productions, Will Wilfred, Fred, what Bonsoir. a nice email. Um, yes, we like seeing your, um, your post on Facebook, oh, that that's was awesome. Right. <laughs> uh, and Zach Martinez is here, um, Oh my goodness! And Zarakino Kim is hey, here. Kim. Hey Kim. Um, wow, this is great. I'm like so so excited, and I I hope maybe Moto just showed up. Very Yay, good, Moto. Um, and if we have any new people who here who are here today and maybe not necessarily um, in the uh, in the uh, chat or uh, saying hello, hello yeah. to you too, hello to everybody on Facebook. Um, if you are new to our channel, uh, we'd sure appreciate it if you'd hit that subscribe button uh, and subscribe to our channel. Uh, likes are great, but yep. but um, subscriptions are even better. So, yeah, and subscriptions have actually um, allowed us to bring you things that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Yes, yeah, so so we have cool. we have super chats now, which is super exciting, uh, super 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 chat exciting. So you can do super chats now, and we can see all that stuff. And uh, uh, welcome to Too Humble, who's new here. How's it going, Too Humble? Welcome. We always like having new people here in the chat. Um, we're extra excited today, so I'm trying not to like just rush through no. everything. But I think it's time for Disney pins, isn't yeah. it? I think it's time for Disney pins. Too. Oh, yes. yours is great. I know. Even though does I even though I have my Vincent Price shirt on today, I chose a very, <laughs> very different pin to go with. I love this um, with the one eyebrow raised. She well, <laughs> yeah. Well, that is that's super him, right? We always have um, that. Hey, Minifig Nick, how's it going? Uh, so I am wearing a Walt Disney World. Oh, we have the autofocus off today. Oh, that's right. I so we're gonna auto we're gonna hold off. it back a little bit. Yeah, I have. You can kind of see it. It is. Uh, yeah, it's Tinkerbell in a compass rose, uh, and it says Walt Disney World on it. So yeah. Yeah, and I've that. got Stitch, who's very excited. <laughs> this is tongue sticking out. Oh, Unikitty pins would be awesome. I wish we had Unikitty. But we pins. have. We do have Unikitty. Hey Shane right. Levan, welcome. How's it right going? There. Uh, let's. Well, part see. of Unikitty. <laughs> part of Unikitty. She's like the Unikitty Cheshire Cat right now. I was gonna try and hook, um, put her on my barrette, but it didn't really work yeah, out. Yeah, I offered to Christopher hot... Coster. It's your birthday today. Happy birthday, happy Christopher! Birthday. All right, a big happy birthday to one of our regulars here um, on the stream. So exciting. <laughs> You know, I um, offered, actually, being the generous guy I am, I offered to hot glue Unikitty to his barrette while it was on his head. Nope. And he declined for... I don't know why. Why would he decline? He also doesn't let me cut his hair, which is probably very smart. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so before before we bring Matthew on, we're going to do our one... Um, we're gonna do our one uh, sticker set for today. Oh, yeah. So let's, real quickly, we'll go to... Thank you. 
All right, sticker set show and tell. I can pop the autofocus back on for a hot second. There okay, today is very colorful. Um, it's um, from 2016. Uh, this set is 10 by 12 studs, um, sort of medium size, and it's from Friends Libby's Pop Star House. Um, and it uh, it came with two mini dolls. And I gotta say, I'm getting excited. Whoops. Having, I love this. I've been reading this. about the costume design for mini dolls, actually, and it never occurred to me. I was like, mini dolls, right? Um, but Andrea has an aqua layered skirt with white sequins on the on the cloth overlay, and Libby has a dark purple layered skirt uh, <laughs> with a purple cloth with gold stars on it. You know, there's a costume designer who is busy. I know. With mini dolls. All right, everyone. So. Um, Speaking of I designers, want, speaking of designers, I don't want to keep uh, keep this too much longer. Uh, but I would like everybody to please give a very warm, huge, tricky lug, tricky bricks welcome to Matthew Ashton. And we will see it. Might you know? Sometimes it's it's Zoom. So there you right. go. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are Hello. you? Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. We can hear you very clearly. Perfect. Oh, this is so great. This is so fun. I was telling everybody that we've been trying, we've been uh, coordinating this for a couple of months now, and um, <laughs> we're just like so excited that you were that you're able to join us today. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. It looks beautiful there right now. It is. Yes, the weather's pretty nice today. So um, yes. It's been really lovely. So, and I'm super excited to to get to chat to you guys as well. So, um, obviously, Lego Masters has been really important to me, and having you guys appear on the show has been been brilliant and very exciting. And I watched your your journey through it, so it's nice to get to talk to you in um, real life as well. I know. Oh, wonderful. We've had a lot. We've had a, a many many months um, Twitter and Instagram messaging <laughs> relationship. So now we finally get to actually. <laughs> Talk in person. So, um, oh, Justin Ramsden is here. Oh, uh -huh. cool. Hello, in the Justin. chat. <laughs> awesome. And I heard somebody's got a birthday today as well. So, happy birthday, Christopher, from me as well. Oh, yeah. Oh. And it's, it's Boone Langston's birthday today as well. Oh, it so, is. yeah. So, happy, happy birthday, birthday Boone well. to, yeah, to we, Boone. We chatted with him this morning. Yeah, I gave him a, gave him a call. I think this we morning. woke him up. <laughs> he said he'd been out of bed like five minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, who's golly. that peeking over your shoulder in the overalls? Oh, this is just, that's one of those minifigures that used to be in, like, our brand stores and toy stores and stuff. So oh, he's great. One of the, the big blow molded guys. There's a, a guy in our lug, Bruce, who every time we have a convention wears a construction helmet around the entire time because he's building with bricks. <laughs> oh, yes, he's like, it's like his favorite accessory. You can always oh. see him from very far away. <laughs> yeah. so, so that guy was actually my um, present on my 10 year anniversary at Lego. Like, everybody buys a gift usually, and, and they were like, What do you want? And I was like, I just want one of those giant minifigures, please. If somebody can find one of those, that'll be brilliant. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I think it must be exciting walking around with what I imagine is a hive of design. Like, I don't know if people have their own offices with doors closed, but I'm just imagining like ideas flowing and people Running, you know, when when people can hang out together, which everyone will again. Yeah. Um, just passing each other in the hallway or on a Zoom meeting now, um, it's all so exciting to me. It is, and I think like a lot of the guys are toy collectors and things anyway. So even in the office, they've got all of their own toy collections over their desks and whatever they're into, as well as all of the Lego stuff. So it's it's super colorful and inspiring and. Yes, we've just started really going back into the office over the last three weeks. So I'm probably doing two or three days a week where I go into the office now. And it's just so nice to see people in real life and, oh, and just bump into people in the corridors and things. It's, it's, it's really lovely to, to well, stop back. If you see if you see uh, Amy and Jamie, please send them. Our, I have our spoken regards. to both of them today, and they've told me to give you a big Lego Master hug. So, oh, um, that's awesome! So <laughs> that's so great. Oh, that's great! <laughs> yes. So they're they're very excited that we're getting to chat as well. Yeah. The, um, well, you know, we are actually maybe even well. Actually, we will eventually be able to actually meet in person next year. 
uh, yes. when we come to the Lego house to, to be in the Masterpiece Gallery. We're super excited about that as well. Exactly. So yeah. we'll definitely need to catch up when you're over here. Yeah, for sure. That'll be so. We'll have to have a, a Justin Ramsden, Jamie and Amy. Like, we'll be... Yeah surrounded by lego royalty i don't know what we're gonna do <laughs> we're gonna have to buy special outfits <laughs> um oh my goodness so we actually have um and we don't want this to be like like endless questions the whole time we want to be yeah, like, yeah, yeah. a chance to chat a chance to chat with matthew and hang out but we do have some questions that we will sprinkle throughout yeah, and <laughs> some, some people sent questions in right yeah we did have some um uh, let me see. Yeah, we've so, we have some that got sent in, and here. So we we did a little bit of homework. So okay. uh, we've done a oh, yeah, no. we, we, we did a little bit of homework, and we're gonna bounce around a little bit. But this is um, we know, and maybe some people in the audience don't know, but you are the creator of Unikitty. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yes. So um, what? Uh, and I think I may know the answer to this question, at least the okay. first half. So this is from Brickanista, uh, aka mm -hmm. Naomi, and she says, "What was the inspiration for Unikitty, and what do you think makes for an iconic character?" Oh, um, well, with Unikitty, she was actually one of the last cast members that was designed. We originally had um, a character in there called Crazy King Carl, and we didn't really like him, and he was very much sort of like a Willy Wonka type chocolate factory um, um, character or, or somebody like that that had just been done so many times before. And then we were also, um, we really, really wanted to up the number of female characters in the movie as well. So that was the starting point. And of course, Wildstyle had already been pretty developed um, by that point, and she's very sort of tough and very badass. and not the most emotional of characters. So then we wanted a character that was the absolute opposite to her, um, somebody who could be super cute and adorable and funny and very, very emotional from extreme to big hyper, super, super happy to, to the, the other extreme where she turns into angry kitty. So we had- <laughs> Within um, half a second. <laughs> yeah, Within yeah, exactly. those extremes. It's kind of like how I react. So, um, yeah, so I think, um, so then we were like, right, she just needs to have a really, really cute aesthetic. So we had to brainstorm with um, Lord and Miller, the directors, and a few other people were on the call. And we were just sort of listing what are the cutest, most adorable things in the whole wide world. And of course, kittens and um, unicorns came to the top of that list. So we were like, right it's one of those and then it was like well why don't we just stick them both together <laughs> so um that was decided and then they actually had some freelance artists do some takes on um uni kitty and a lot of them were really clunky and really big and they wanted the characters to ride around on her back and she just wasn't looking cute at all and i was like can, can i just have a quick go at this one and i just wanted to strip her away to being as few bricks as possible, not worry about posability, because like when kids are playing with a toy horse, they kind of just jump around like that and, <laughs> and movable legs isn't really a thing. So we were like, right, let's just eradicate any sort of posability, make her as simple as possible. And um, so I worked on the build with her and then some initial sketches on sort of what a face should look like. And then I got um, a guy who's really good at like kawaii graphics and things called um, um, Matteo Oliviero, who is, is one of our designers as well, he did a few passes on the face, and she was actually the quickest character to get approved out of the entire movie. She was done within like two weeks. So, <laughs> wow, uh, awesome. You know, so it's... I, yeah, so I think creating an iconic character, it's obviously, it, it's, it's matching sort of the visual identity of that character and also making sure that the way they look also expresses her personality as well at the same time. So if you can get those two things tied in together, then um, I think that's what helps um, when you're designing a character like that. Interesting. You know, so we met um, we met Elia. I was thinking uh, the same at thing. At by yeah. the Bay, and we we saw his uh, presentation on yes. um, creating the Queen Whatever character and how yes. many iterations that she went through. Yes, she was the opposite of Unikitty. She <laughs> took months to, to, to get a final <laughs> design on her. So, um, yes, but like we're, I'm really happy how she turned out and how different she is to, to Unikitty as well, and that she 
sort of embodied creativity in in the way that she was built and what she could change into. So. Um, well, it's just he, one thing he mentioned that it, I, as a designer, I, as a lighting designer, I find this painful, but also something that you have to do is that Queen Whatever actually got pretty far along one direction. And then it was like, er, let's go another direction after yeah. like lots of lots of involvement. So as a designer, I think it's really hard to let things go. I mean, do you it find is. that? Yeah, d definitely. And I, I think as well, whenever you're designing anything, you have the dream of what the ultimate thing um, should be. And then, of course, with costing and all of these things that you have to go through with when you're designing a model, you then have to make sure you make the right sort of compromises in reducing it down to what it needs to be, but still keep the essence of, of, of what your original idea is. So. Um, yeah, so I think that that can be a little painful for everybody that you create something and you fall in love with it and then you you kind of need to turn, massage it into it, it sort of fitting all of the other parameters that it needs to other than just looking, looking awesome. That's so funny because I know that one of, and it's because I like creepy things, but I have to say like one <laughs> of my favorite um, drawings that Ilya showed was this sort of like, Praying, ma almost like praying mantis, like terrifying praying mantis. It's like a huge <laughs> alien. And of course, thing. I loved it, but at the same time, yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, I could see where that would be really terrifying and probably not the best <laughs> direction to go. I know, exactly. And that, that was actually really tricky with her because we needed to sort of create the sense that she was a baddie, but not really a baddie. And so, so to have an aesthetic that sort of fell between those two things that she could go either way was also um, making her design quite complicated because if you are just designing a clear villain or just um, designing a clear good guy it's really easy to do those things but to sort of uh, trick people's perception into not knowing exactly what it's supposed to be um, um, was quite a challenge with her. So I'm curious mm. this actually like leads into another question that we had um, it's kind of related to what is exactly what is the relationship between um, like the graphic design team and then the the brick building team. And I mean that in like, not only in creating characters, but like, w of course, I'm sure you probably know this, but like uh, stickers are like highly controversial. Like some people really <laughs> love them. Yes, no. <laughs> some people really hate them. We are personally, we love stickers and we dedicate uh, a whole segment. A sticker segment. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so we, um, and so I'm just interested in, in how that, cause I, you did say when you were talking earlier that you actually took a pass at drawing what her face yeah. would look like. So I'm yeah. just curious, like on a regular, um, you know, just like on a regular new set that you're coming up with, who is the sort of progenitor of the look of a of a character? Um, would that it be the yes? So it mainly is the the graphic designer, um, and it also it's very dependent on whether it's a licensed product or something that we're creating our, ourselves. So if, it, if it's something that we're creating ourselves, then the creative lead, who is kind of the design manager of the project, will sort of brief we need this many characters, this is the overall look of, of so they suggest what what, um, what what the character needs to generally look like and, and what we want to get across with the theme. So they'll write um, a brief for each of the characters and then um, the graphic designers will then come with a range of ideas and, and try things out. And, and, and sometimes mm -hmm. some of us do some sketches to help out and, and brainstorm in that process as well and gather sort of reference material of like, oh, this kind of aesthetic so we create a, a little mood board or something for, for um, what the characters could potentially look like. But then it is the graphic designer's sort of responsibility and their, and their, their job to um, bring the graphics um, to what they what they will look like in production. So, and of course, depending on the project and depending on, on the, the, the subject matter as well. You may have some designers who are builders who are real experts on the theme that can offer advice and things throughout the process as well to, to sort of steer that. But um, yeah, so it's it's the um, creative lead and design manager has the final sign off. But um, the, the graphic guys are very capable and do a great job. And, um... Oh, I, I, I think, 
Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I think graphic designers are maybe unsung heroes. I'm, I'm imagining yes. like yeah. Unikitty with no face would be a very different <laughs> character. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be the opposite of you. <laughs> well, well, so what I always use an ex as an example for my yeah. my like support of stickers is um, the Ninjago City set, which is like yes. one of my maybe oh, favorite yeah. all-time sets that I ever yeah, put yeah. together. And the difference in the model with no stickers and yes. the model with stickers is yes. it's vast like it really yeah. like it really i think in especially in that one the graphics and all the stickers really support mm -hmm. and elevate the model um yeah. and i think it's yeah i just love it i love those exactly no and, and i feel exactly the same i think we've, we've got some really brilliant graphic designers and it's also what brings up models to life and especially the character graphics and everything that is sort of the entry point for a lot of kids finding mm -hmm. a really appealing character that helps them create a little inner movie in their head and know what they want to play with it and it, it, it's so important that we we get those right and, and um, we've got a brilliant team that does a great job on that. That's something I've thought for a long time and we've talked about and I think Brickmaster Amy talks about it too is that minifigures have stories built right in yeah. right you get a minifigure and there's already immediately a story it's where we started mm -hmm. building our first our first mocks right? right but but at the same time it also allows you the leeway to let to put your own story like on top right like, like it I kind mean, of yeah. has a little of yeah. both going on which exactly. i exactly and and that's what we really tried to do with minifigure collectibles as well because up until that point everything had been very sort of theme driven that you had a space theme or a power miners theme or an aqua raiders theme or whatever it was so the characters were always contained within a predefined universe to a certain extent and that's when we really really pushed with minifigures to make we just want to create all the characters that have never been available anywhere else and by mm. putting a caveman in a kid's hand then it can inspire them to build a prehistoric world to put a clown in a kid's hand then then they can build a circus that they never thought about before so so we really tried to to create a range of characters with that that would really spark people's imagination. So I think it worked. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm glad it worked. I mean, just, it's it's funny. So you know, so I go to work every day and I do my cat yeah. designs and all that, and I come home. Uh, well, although it's all in the same place yeah, now, I and I would, I'm way. very serious about organization and all this, and so I didn't realize that I was playing with minifigures all the time because I just thought I was organizing them and putting them, but really I'm just playing with minifigures. <laughs> <laughs> so now did you, um, uh, I mean, we did some homework, but obviously not, um, we, you know, we didn't. It's all right, I don't everything. No, <laughs> no, so I'm, I'm just curious, um, so like what, how much involvement did you have in the creation of the collectible minifigure series? Was this something that, like, was this your idea or an idea that a group of people came up with, or? Like, nothing at Lego is just one person's idea, of to be course, honest. Of I course, of course. I think um, in my second week at Lego, we had um, what we call a design boost, and that's kind of where they get all of the designers together for a few days, and you do all-nighters and stuff, and we were asked to come up with any um, sort of concepts that we thought would be a great idea um, to launch. And I was brand new into the company then, assigned to some girls' product lines that we were working on. So really didn't have a lot of awareness of what was going on um, in the rest of the portfolio. I'd loved minifigures since I was a kid, and mm -hmm. it was the one thing that, that sort of drew me into Lego. So my first or second week, at this boost, I was drawing a collectible range of minifigures, and that had sort of a lot of the, the ones that we've, we've ultimately launched now. And um, and then also I did a lot of celebrity figures. I had like Wonder Woman and She-Ra and, and mm. all the, all these kind of characters in there as well. Took it into the conference room and was like, ta-da! And was pretty much laughed out of the conference room by the marketing team. It's like, minifigures aren't popular. They're never going to, we're never going to be able to sell them by themselves. And, oh. and, that, was, and that was actually at a stage where a lot of the consumer testing that we were doing on minifigures were like, kids were just sort of very dismissive of them and they were seen as an accessory to sets rather than them being really meaningful and it was just because we weren't creating characters that were really iconic and really inspiring mm. so once i got on the other side of the fence and was able to get my mitts onto minifigures mm. and sort of try and refine that a bit more and make everything 
really, really iconic, really appealing, really sort of aligned from a styling point of view. I was actually, I've just, I'm, I'm actually working on the update of this here, but I was working on the minifigure style guide, which is basically um, when, when I got transferred onto um, play themes, um, the alignment in in the way that people were drawing minifigures and animating minifigures was just completely all over the place. And I was like, look, we have to be as protective about the minifigure as Disney is about Mickey Mouse. And we need to sort of sharpen all this up, make it look consistent. So that was one of my first tests um, when I started working on play themes and with the minifigure. And then ultimately we did get to the point that the popularity was growing enough video games really helped and all of that kind of stuff to, that we could then take the plunge and be like, right, we're going to um, launch a blind bag collectible line. So it was quite a journey in getting there, <laughs> but, but it happened in the end, possibly 10 years after I pitched it. But um, yes, you can never give up these little fights. So, but of course there was a lot of people involved in, in actually creating the line when we, when we got to doing it. So, did, did, did just I, I'm <laughs> so, fanning out. I'm fanning out a little bit. I've got to say, I don't really do that. But like, you lifted up the, <laughs> the style guide, and I felt like you had lifted the magic curtain. I know. We were <laughs> really, really excited. But did you have any idea that when you did this, that thousands upon thousands of A falls would be standing in toy stores doing this with bags to figure <laughs> out what was in it? Or would... well, we were like, how do we stop them doing that? And we're like, no, actually, that's a good thing. So, um, no, I'm glad it was, it ended up that way. It was a real, real struggle to begin with, because especially in, like, there's a lot of collectibles in similar blind packaging and stuff in, in Europe before we'd launched this. But in the US, it was something that was never really seen before. And a lot of the retailers were like, we can't sell something if people don't know what's inside it. And <laughs> people will open them and return it if they don't get the one that they want. And, and just sort of, 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 of sort of massaging the, the retailers into like, give this a shot and, and we think it will work out and, and everything. So actually the, the fiddling of the bags <laughs> has probably helped <laughs> in that respect as well. But then that was also with the packaging as well, the reason why the blind bags are so difficult to open is because we had to make sure that people weren't opening them in the stores and the retailers yeah. just being left with a load of open bags and, and stolen minifigures as well. So there was a lot of sort of logistics and even just getting products packed in a little foil bag for um, a company that's used to sticking things in big square boxes. We had to find entirely new production setups and everything. So what looks like the simplest product that we've ever launched was probably quite a lot more complicated than anybody thinks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, there's a lot of enthusiasm. So yeah. <laughs> some of our homework tells us that you um, actually were into fashion design at a certain point. Yes. Yes. So and textiles. Yes. So well, this this was a thing like when when I was really really little. And I, I played Lego a lot with my brother, and it literally it was the only thing that we ever played with that we didn't argue about. <laughs> so <laughs> we were completely different, like chalk and cheese. While I was twirling around in the garden, praying I'd turn into Wonder Woman, he's chopping all the flowers to pieces with his lightsaber, and we were just <laughs> very, very different, <laughs> very different kids. So Lego was the one thing that we kind of had in common. And I remember thinking when I was a kid, I'd just seen like big. The movie where Tom Hanks becomes a toy designer, like the little kid grows up into Tom Hanks and becomes a toy designer. And I was really into Pinocchio and stuff with where obviously a toy comes to life and just all of those things were were kind of adding up. And, and I remember playing with my Lego and at that point it was literally, I want to be a toy designer when I grow up. But then as you get older, you're like, oh, that's not a real job. And nobody, <laughs> I don't know anybody that does that. And so I always wanted to do something creative. So I went to art college and did a foundation course where you study a little bit of fashion and textiles. You do some graphics, you do some fine art, you do all, all different disciplines for, and that's several modules throughout a year. And then um, that led to me ultimately going and studying fashion and textile design at university. And then when I graduated, um, you obviously do your runway show at London Fashion Week and at uh, Graduate Fashion Week. And then we had an exhibition in Islington in London. 
where you have a teeny tiny space to display your work and most fashion designers just hang up one garment in their portfolio or something and because I was being really indecisive I decided to make a miniature version of my entire collection on Barbie dolls and display them at that exhibition yes. and luckily awesome. there was um, Lego talent scouts at that exhibition who had gone there to see some to, to meet with some industrial designers and some graphic designers just happened to walk past my stand and spotted my stuff and were like oh we're looking for somebody who needs to to work on some gold products and possibly do some fashion illustrations and all of that kind of stuff so then that's where i was spotted and ultimately hired in to work on so, um, you were yeah. discovered. That's amazing. Yeah, that's that's awesome. such a plucked, cool story. Plucked from obscurity and given <laughs> the job that that little six or seven year old version of me had been praying for but didn't think was a real thing. So, um, yeah, so it, it's been an amazing journey getting there. And I'm, I'm, I know I'm super lucky as well. That's that's really cool. So, I'll, so I wonder too, is there, um, speaking of like the collectible minifigures, some of the um especially more and more lately the the yeah. um the printing on the on the torsos and the legs have gotten so intricate and, and the back too and the backs and yeah. just like um beautifully detailed and there's some that are just like you want to take a magnifying glass because <laughs> i have grandpa eyes so i need a magnifying <laughs> glass to see all the details but it's just fascinating so i'm i wonder um is there actually like a separate group of people who just work on like the the costuming if you will like is that like someone's job or is it more like if you're a graphic designer you work on x a whole bunch of different things yeah so so um basically graphic designers are usually assigned to the entire project so you'll have like an Ninjago graphic designer that works both on the, the characters' decals and the stickers and everything at the same time. Or there may be a couple of designers assigned to each product um, line. But generally, they share the workload. Everybody loves doing the minifigures and mini dolls, so everybody wants to get their hands on them because that's that's the fun bit that becomes a physical toy. And um, yeah, so, so generally, mm. and that's what the, the guidelines that I've just shown you sort of set the, the the sort of guardrails for this is how thick the line should be this is color palettes and, and all of the details and sort of giving them the starting point but then they can just sort of let their imaginations run wild and of course there are limitations of the number of colors that we can print on on in one process and things so so they do have to work within with all of those limitations but they they do an amazing job of, of really bringing some fabulous characters to life that's you know, so I, cool. I heard this since my very earliest art classes that an artist's limitations are their greatest assets. But as a yeah. as someone who builds mocks in Lego, I think the limitations of the medium are inspiring. Because yeah. I don't have this color to do it, I think about other colors that can go together. Yeah. Or I don't have this shape, so how can I recreate it? Yeah. Exactly. And and designers at, at Lego, you know, encounter the same limitations of the medium right yeah. although they can say let's make a new piece <laughs> <laughs> i know but it's not even that easy because we are assigned a set number of pieces that we're allowed to introduce each year and we have to discontinue a, a set number of pieces as well so then we and then that's part of my job is sort of assigning how many elements are then assigned to each product line and then they have to sort of prioritize within all of the hundreds of ideas that they want to do, what are the top six things that are a must have for each each line as well. So it's it's not like we can completely go to town and create everything that we want to. Um, no. Okay, well then then I have to ask, what what piece got discontinued so that we could have a Lego poop? <laughs> Cause actually I, and I I say that because one of the very first tweets i ever saw from you or instagram posts was you talking about you remembering the day that you had to approve the the lego oh. poop piece <laughs> i i don't know exactly which element went out for that one to come in but i was like and it was actually tara who's she's she's called minifigure mama on um twitter she she's been the lead on uh, minifigures for quite some time and she came to me and she's like are we okay doing a poop and i'm like well emojis and everybody who poops all over the place so everybody else is doing it why shouldn't we do it so um yeah 
Plus, it makes good ice cream, like an alternate exactly. part for an ice cream. So, yeah. you know, it, it's you probably the best ice cream element that we've got as well. I do. I like that. Well, I like the I like the little the one with the scoops, the multiple yeah, scoops the on it. Type one, yeah. yeah, I use the green ones for uh, for like trees and bushes and micro builds. Yeah. Like they're, I think yeah. they're they have a lot going on. Okay, let's see. We've got um, just like I want to do a couple more questions and then we can move on to some other general things. So, um, Brickworm asks, how much time does a designer of a set have from like start to finish? I guess maybe like what's the life of like how long is the life of a set from conception to to shelf? Right. This is a bit of a tricky one because depending on the product line, these can vary quite a lot. So if, for example, you're working on Lego City and it's like, right, you've got to do a new fire truck, designers may actually be working on multiple models at the same time. But generally, we mm. have to have the design locked somewhere between 18 and 15 months before it goes into product, but before it, it ends up on shelf. And within that time period, it's probably about three months that they have to, to sort of get each, each design done, but they may be working on multiples at the same time. But then if you're working on like a really brand new concept, like something that's requiring a lot of sort of market research and things like that, like when we were doing Ninjago for the first time, that was mm. actually probably two years development, sort of getting the theme right and and really understanding and creating the story and the story bibles and everything that you need to do um, to make the theme come together in totality. So getting all of that done, tested with kids, getting the reactions, refining it um, can take quite a few years in some instances before then. Mm. But then once the theme is, is locked and we know what we're doing, it's probably three months um, that, that they get um, roughly per, per model and um, yeah. Wow, that time was so well spent on Ninjago. I love yeah. that that series. It's I, one of my thing, favorite lines. The thing that draws yeah. me to it more than anything else, more than the adventure and the best hair, I love the Ninjago <laughs> hair. hair. Other than mini dolls, we take hair from mini dolls. We love the <laughs> mini, we love mini doll hair. Um, is the architecture, the architecture yeah. and roof treatments, especially in Ninjago, are mm -hmm. just brilliant. I learned so yeah. many techniques from for what we do in our unmocks. Yeah. I think Temple of Erjitsu was our like our first really big model that we ever got. Okay. And that was um yeah, and we were just like, ah, this is amazing. Yeah. And it was it was especially weird because we they um we had we were basically booted out of our apartment for almost two months because they had to repair something in our bedroom. Yeah. And that was kind of the set that we bought that got us through the like we were, you know, staying at somebody's Airbnb with our with you know our very old dog <laughs> who needed to be carried up and down stairs and it was just like and, and it, it was raining and it was, it was raining dreary, and awful but and it was the holidays and that set made us so happy yeah and it was really it Can't like you say oh yeah, it started our love of nin, of, of the nin, the whole ninjago line yeah. really yeah. Was, and i think with ninjago as well it was one of those things because sometimes you sense that a theme has got something that's going to have a lot of longevity and stuff. And, and with a theme like that, you look like rather than rush it out and get it on the market, it's like, let's give it the breathing space that mm. it needs to become everything that it needs to. So um, there was everybody in the company was like, Ninjago looks like it's going to be great. And, and I was like, slow down, people. It can only be great if we let it be great. And and. Um, I think having that extra time to to get to get all of the ducks in or in a row and get all of the details right before we launched it was was um, was really really important and it just goes to show that if you give something the time it needs up front and if you look at how long Ninjago's lasted as a line um, it even surprised us because at first it was like oh probably three year lifespan and then it was like oh my god this is really taken off we need to we need to keep going with this as well so. So I'm just going to ask you two more questions about working at Lego, and then we're going to yes. move on to some other stuff. Um, so one more question from Brickworm is, um, do set designers get to pitch ideas, or are they given assignments? Um, a bit of both. Probably more given assignments in general, but what we do is 
the creative booths that I mentioned um, early on where I came with the minifigure ideas when I first started, that's sort of an activity that we hold two or three times a year where any designer can sort of pitch any idea that they, they want to. Um, and then we figure out if, if, how commercial any of those are and, and wh whether it's, 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 it's got the, the legs to sort of, of really become something that could fly. And um, yes, so I think, um, so that's general sort of ad hoc ideas, um, but within the lines themselves as well. Um, obviously with a licensed product, you're kind of given the reference material and you, mm -hmm. you need to, to yeah. sort of follow whatever the latest Star Wars ships are being introduced and things. Um, but within the lines themselves, like Ninjago, there'll be big brainstorms within the team of right, who's going to be next year's bad guys, what's the mission going to be? And they sort of flush out and come with a load of concepts and then they'll be tested um, with, with kids to get reactions on them. And um, yeah, so theme by theme, it, it's kind of done um, a little differently. And then, and then we have these creative boosts throughout the year as well. That's so awesome. interesting. It's, you know, I always think of, of uh, we do design, uh, we do design drawings and we do lots of photo research for our mm -hmm. mocks. Um, but also some of the, um, some of the best stuff has come from just assembling bricks. And it seems yeah. like a lot of the projects and characters have a sort of a soul before any bricks are put together. It's like, yeah. this is what we want to embody. And then, yeah. Yeah. Mm. so I'm, uh, so just, because everybody likes to know these things, um, could you name <laughs> some sets that you have like personally been involved in? I know you're basically personally involved in all of them, but is there any <laughs> ones maybe like from earlier in your career, like like specific yeah. sets that you worked on? Yes, so, and to be honest, I know this surprises everybody, but I haven't worked on as many sets as people think I am. So I'm always a bit embarrassed when, I, uh, when I'm asked this. So um, the products that, I, um, obviously there was a lot of the Click It stuff, that was more sort of general sort of styling, and I did all of the character design for the girls on the Click It packaging and all of that, so they were my illustrations. And then at the same time I did, um, I worked a little bit in Creator really early on, so there was one set, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but that was um, a creature set that had um, a crab and a chameleon in it. I designed the crab and the chameleon, and then there was another guy called Peter Brinsel that did. There was an ant and a scorpion and, and things like that. So it was kind of creepy crawlies with a few slightly <laughs> cuter <laughs> crawly <laughs> things in it. And I, and I was in charge of the cuter stuff of that. And then I worked, I was really, Aqua Raiders was my first play theme once I started working on minifigure based stuff. Um, but I was already put in a, a sort of a, a managerial role then. Um, so there wasn't that much building um, that I did then, but I was really involved in Castle 2007, 2008. That's the one where it was um, the Skeleton Warriors and then it went on to be Dwarfs and, and all of that kind of stuff. So that was, that was really driven a lot by me. I did a few of the smaller sets in that one and the advent calendars and stuff. And um, yes, and then I worked a lot on things like agents and um, monster fighters. And yes, uh, yay. Monster fighters. Yay. We love so, well, our very, very, very favorite theme. <laughs> cool. Anything spooky. Yes. And then I did, I was on Alien Conquest and then at the same time I was in charge of um, a lot of the um, intellectual properties that we did. So that was, um, Indiana Jones and, and a few of those and, and the first wave of Toy Story and stuff. So uh, a lot of my job back then because I was in charge of um, IPs was um, going to meet with all of the studios and have their pictures of which up and coming movies that were, were on the cards and what we wanted to team up with. So um, Indy was a bit of a dream come true because I loved those movies as a kid, but there weren't really a huge amount of toys. So being able to then mm -hmm create a project that was like, oh my God, this is bringing my childhood to, to life has been um, a lot of fun. That okay. was one of our first sets, and What's it was that? a major discovery. Indiana Jones. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a discovery. The box was all broken down, and we were amazed the pieces were all there. We got oh, it at oh. I think a garage sale. No, right? actually, I, uh -oh. uh, I well, it, the only thing was missing is the ball because, of course, yeah. that's like the one thing that's always anything round is always going to roll under the couch and not get found. 
but it was one of the first times that I ever uh, bought something like used off of Craigslist. And I actually yeah. took like public transportation 45 minutes out into like the middle of nowhere and met the guy like in the parking lot of a of the <laughs> of the public transport of the BART station and it was it felt really weird. Like I felt like I should have like a trench coat and a hat and <laughs> big glasses. Like but yeah, it was great and we ended up with that great set. Now I know I said only two more, but I actually have one that I just thought of. Okay, you can ask whatever you want to um, Oh, thank you. So we all see the amazing, you know, the amazing sets and the modular buildings and the Ninjago and the monster fighters and all the stuff that we love. And I don't know if you can talk about this or not, but has there ever been, and you can just pick one, something that just ended up on the cutting room floor that you were just like, oh man, I really wish we could have done blah, blah, blah. Um... Yes, but I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about them. <laughs> that's okay. That's <laughs> fair. Okay. That that's fair. Do. And and I, I think as well, there was actually a second wave of Alien Conquest that was amazing, and it was mm. just um, uh, that that that's probably the one I can talk about that's probably not going to come back. Um, yes, and that was that was that was really really sad because the, there was a lot of really great models. So Alien Conquest was kind of one of my favorites that it was just the first time that we'd done space but space in a really silly way yeah and, um yes and and i think um because the sales of the first wave just didn't take off in the way that we'd hoped for then then the second wave got pulled so and those models were all sort of fully developed and then the other model <laughs> that um, was in the Lego Movie one which was hilarious and it actually ended up being printed on um, a McDonald's Happy Meal cup. It was a product that was supposed to be launched and then got edited out of the movie, so we had to cancel. Was President Business had this sort of mech office chair that he used to like, <laughs> they had like a giant stapler as a hand and like an office fan to sort of propel it and things. It was it was completely ridiculous. So that did sort of make it out there visually by ending up on a McDonald's Happy Meal cup uh, because they went into production way before it was edited out of the movie, but mm -hmm. that, that one got dropped. And um, yeah, so they're, they're probably the two that I can talk about. Awesome. That's no, that's great. I just you know, that's always you always want to know about the scene that got edited out of the movie that you didn't yeah. you know you didn't know. Um, all right, so let's move on to talking about Lego Masters. Because yeah. like, we all have a relationship to that here we right do. now. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested now, am I correct that the show started in the UK? Yes, yes. So uh, we, we were the guinea pig. <laughs> for yes. This whole, whole, uh, process. And of course, um, yes, yeah, so. Um, Tuesday Childhood, the production company, came to us with sort of an idea to do um, a, a a kind of challenge show, and it was actually stemmed from um, I'd been part of a documentary maybe two years before that, where um, we recorded um, a little bit about our recruitment process and the way that we hire mm. designers is we get everybody's portfolios in, we sort of select who we think would be really good contenders, fly them over to Bill and set them some building tests, set them some teamwork tests and things. And all of that was kind of recorded. And it was actually um, the, in, in that show is actually when we hired Justin Ramston. So you, you know Justin. So um, so mm -hmm. he, he, was, he was hired as part of that. And after they'd seen that, they were like, actually, getting people in a room, building Lego together, setting them tests, Kind of like challenges all of those things kind of have hinted to what could be a great format for a tv show so then um that was pitched around in the uk we got picked up by channel four and then um i was cast as the judge on channel and four which was super exciting but terrifying at the same time <laughs> because of course no tv training not, none of that at all and it, it's just kind of you and and I'd expected a little bit more training before it actually started, and that wasn't the case. So it was literally <laughs> pushed in front of cameras and, and go for it. And and of course, the show was really really successful. It got great viewership, and 
then that kind of spawned the Australian version that went then went on and the German yep. version and then ultimately the US version. We've just done a version for the Netherlands as well. So it's um, yeah, so it's been really, really special to be part of that. And and especially for me personally, it was kind of it was exactly what I needed um, back then as well. Because I'd I'd had and I don't want to go too much into this, but I've had like some personal um, issues outside of work and and then a lot of stress at work. And I kind of got to the point where I'm like, I was so burnt out that I had to have some time off work. And then I was a bit sort of questioning, am I doing the right thing? Should I stay with Lego? And then that opportunity came up and it wasn't until I met the contestants and saw how passionate they were mm. about Lego and saw how creative they were. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a reminder of why I do the job that I'm doing. And it was just mm. so important to me personally to sort of give me my mojo back and give me the pick up the ass that I needed. That that, that was such a huge sort of turning point in, in my life as well. That it, that's, that's why it's doubly special to me because everything that it's done for the brand and, and, and raising people's awareness of how open-ended and creative the, the, the Lego system is because I think we kind of, and, and we're rightfully perceived this way, is a lot of the way people perceive us is, is one set, you build it, you play with it, you stick it on your shelf, whereas Lego Masters is like, no, this is what Lego is all about. So, um, so getting that out there has been amazing. And just seeing the feedback that we were getting from the UK show, um, mums were just tweeting pictures of, look how creative my kids are being in their feet such in a pile of bricks on the floor with Lego Masters on the TV in the background and things. And it's just, it's just so lovely the impact that it's had. And of course, then going to the US and it being huge budget production <laughs> compared to our slightly <laughs> cheaper <laughs> US version, then it, it, it's just become everything that we set out for it to be. And um, yeah, so hopefully um, we'll be rolling it out in a lot more countries as, as well. And, We'll, we'll see what's happening with, with the UK. So um, no confirmation awesome. either way yet, but hopefully we'll be back. Well, I don't, I, I don't mean to interrupt this, but the, but the chat is exploding to tell us that it is Logan cookie time. So we are going right. to do our Logan cookie time little animation, and then we'll be right back for Logan cookie time, everybody. Here we go. Okay. All right, Logan cookie time. Here he goes. Come on, buddy. Woohoo! There it's he time is. for Logan. Logan. And I heard, Matthew, that you have a guest for Logan cookie time as well. I don't have a real dog, but I've got puppy corn. Yay, Prince Puppy Corn <laughs> is joining us for Logan cookie time. This is a momentous occasion. Can you catch? <laughs> All right, good boy. good boy, Logan. All right. Thank Yay. You, <laughs> Uh, that was awesome. And we got to share a Logan cookie time with Matthew Ashton and Puppy Corn. That's like... Uh... I, know. And I also have another exclusive here. Nobody has ever seen her, but I've just got a Dr. Fox. What? Wow. That then... is awesome. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Yay! You need, we need this. We well, need this well we, we joke because Flynn's kind of the front man and like super outgoing and I'm more like, you know, you know, technic and structure and all this that I'm yeah. Richard. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm definitely the Unikitty in this, in this relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's great. How cool. I love that. I want to see that, that we need that Richard uh, yeah. plush. I will, I will find a way. Um, I don't know. She, he's custom made for me, so I don't know where he's going to get one from. But uh, I'll yeah. make one. We know lots of <laughs> people. You know, something I, I wanted to say, I, I thought is so cool about the UK version of the show is that they had kids on the show. Yeah. And what I've heard is people are like, oh, they have a disadvantage. You know, the older builders are more experienced. But what I heard is that the kids had an advantage with imagination. Yes. And I, I, th I think that was really the case. Obviously, judging the show where it's adults versus kids is the worst. Oh, to be I'm honest, so sorry. It, it's like, no, so, and of course, it was a really, really enjoyable experience, but you knew that times would come where you'd have to eliminate some kids and send them home. And, and of course, 
everything that we did also behind the scenes as well to make it as caring as, as we possibly could. But it was it was heartbreaking in a few ways. And like literally every episode. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> It's like, oh my God, I don't want, I, I literally wanted Lego Masters to be just like a giant big Lego play date. Everybody came and built stuff and had fun and we didn't have to send anybody home. Unfortunately, that does not make very gripping television. So, <laughs> but all of the kids were so incredible and, um, and honestly, their imaginations were just running wild and the stories that they tell about the models that they created were, were, were just just really, really, really inspiring. And of course, yes, they didn't have the technical know-how that some of the adults had, but on all of the minifigure-based challenges where they could create scenarios and things, it was yeah. incredible that the stories that they were coming up with. So um, yes, there were a few weeks where, where adults were sent home because the kids did, did such a good job with, with that. Oh, so I just wanted to thank Holly. Thanks, Holly, for the super chat. And Holly says, um, Matt needs his own Lego prank show so people can say, where's Ashton? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes, apparently you need your own Lego prank show. I don't know. I don't oh, quite I do. know what that would be. I don't I'm know not sure what that what would be. But, yes, yeah, like, you know, you give them a set that it sounds like there's something in it and they open it and it's just, you know. Mega blocks. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, no. Goodbye. No, 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 sorry, I'm kidding. I'm so joking. I'm so joking. Oh my goodness. Uh, anyway, that's um, yeah. So, um, so I would. So, you were talking earlier about like not having any of the television training, and I yeah. because of course we did neither. You know, I mean, like no. I, I'm a theater person and I've been mm -hmm. on stage, and we we both have. Yeah. Um, but it's very different than um, it's very yeah. very different than um, having than... thirteen cameras pointed at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and also and I was thinking too. So I know a lot of like when we were on the show, a discussion between a lot of the um, of the contestants were like, "Whoa, this is so crazy! Like I can't believe it! Like my life is so different." And you know, whenever we would see Amy and Jamie, they were always like completely done, hair done, awesome outfits, like completely together. Um, very, um, you know, very sure of themselves and that sort of thing. And I think we all just sort of took it for granted that they, you yeah. know, that they were knew what they were doing. And then I was thinking about it one night, and I mentioned this to the rest of the contestants. I was like, can you imagine, like, however weird it is for us right now, yeah. like how weird it must be for them coming from, like, you know, working at this amazing company, but you're in an office. Like you don't, you're not, um, you know, you're not like going and being on TV and being, and it's a complete change of lifestyle for that whatever hey, hey, three hey. months that you're there. And then I know yeah. also that you um, are a producer on three, on all three Lego movies, um, including yeah. the Batman one, and an executive producer of the Unikitty show that's on Cartoon Network. So at a certain point, like, how were you even managing to do all of those things, like, and and stay I, sane? I, and and I, be I so present. <laughs> happily worked for a bit due to doing all of those things at some point. So I think, to be honest, like, even having a job as a toy designer is a dream job in the, in the first place. So then when these other opportunities came along, because I've always loved like animation, been a huge fan of Disney and Pixar and all of that kind of stuff. And then being able to be involved in the Lego movies was just, it was incredibly hard work um, because um, obviously we're based in Denmark, the directors were based in LA, the production company Animal Logic was based in Sydney. So you're doing it, everything on all of these complicated time zones and having to do mm. video conferences in the middle of the night and, and all of that kind of stuff. But it was just so inspiring to sort of step out of your day job a little bit, but still have everything that, because obviously everything that I've learned through Lego on how to make things look right from a Lego perspective and everything were really helpful, I hope, for, for, for them in making the movie. But then having me be exposed to an entirely different creative industry and getting to work with some really amazing people on 
fun, a, a big project like that. Obviously, there's people in animation that work for years and years and years and have to work on low budget things before they get anywhere. So the fact that mm. I was able to, to to work directly with people like Chris and uh, Chris um, Chris and Phil and and those guys was just like it, it was an absolutely amazing experience. So um, yeah, so that was kind of and it is it it was really really hard work and of course there's a lot of discussions and. A lot of opinions, and, um, <laughs> so I I was so proud with how Lego Movie One turned out, and the reception to it kind of surprised mm -hmm. everyone because I think there were so many naysayers around the Lego Movie, like oh this is just a giant toy commercial and it's never going to be anything apart from a commercial and and things, and the fact that it was so heartfelt and so meaningful and so creative and such to me, the truest expression of the brand that we've ever created in animation form as well. The fact that it's all stop motion and we play up the limitations of the minifigure and that makes them fun that Emmett can't actually do real jumping jacks and, and all of that good stuff just added to the charm. And yeah, so that, that was really, really amazing to be part of. And of course, all of the subsequent movies as well have, have had their ups and downs, but I think um, we've created some really great stuff that's inspired a lot of kids. So that that's that's really rewarding at the same time it being immensely hard work. And then um, Lego Masters was kind of, um, that was as I, I'd, I'd been off on sick leave and was just sort of coming back to work. So I was only doing one or two days work in Denmark, then having to fly back to the UK every weekend to, oh. to film. So, um, that was a little intense. <laughs> what challenge are we on today? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, but uh, hope, hopefully we, we pulled it off and made it look as professional as we could. But, but that was also, it was, I think, just kind of, for me, exposing myself in that way and putting myself out there was, was kind of, of really, really daunting for the fact that I hadn't been well and then that was the first thing I was doing and it was going to be very, very public. I'm like, this could either be the stupidest thing that I've ever done in my life or, or, or the best thing that, that I've ever done. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad I gave it a shot and it, it, was, it was an amazing experience. So I've been really lucky throughout my career that projects have popped up that I'm like, oh my God, this is the most exciting thing that I could ever dream of. And, and then I managed to, to, to sort of be part of it and shape it. So that's been, that's, that's kind of what's kept me going. <laughs> Well, I, I, I know, I'm interested to hear your take on this, but I know that the experience for, um, like, audience perception of people is, um, on TV is obviously a lot of it is dictated by um, uh, editing and, yeah. you know, all that sort of thing. And, you know, they can, you know, editing can be, be it cuts both ways. <laughs> it can be yeah. kind and cruel. Um, yeah. But... Um, did you feel like, um, especially when you first started doing it, did you feel um, like personally e exposed in any way, like as, as in like your personal life? And because I know like um, I felt as a contestant that yeah. our life and the, and the people that we are was, was um, m put out there more than say like, I would think that anybody who watched Lego Masters US would feel like that they know more about us than they would necessarily know about Amy and Jamie's like personal yeah. lives. Um, yes. um, now, how did you feel um, that like being on that show or, you know, being a judge there reflected your, on your personal life or, or, or if it did or didn't? Um, not, not hugely. Obviously the viewership in the UK is a little smaller than it is in the US, but I think that my, 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 the biggest challenge I had was as a starting point, me being chosen to go on that show, you kind of, you want to be yourself. You also want to represent the Lego brand. You also need to deliver what makes good TV and, and, and what the, yeah. the pr production company wants to a certain extent. And there was no sort of interference in any of the decision making but I was kind of pushed to sort of be a bit of a face of authority. And in real life, I'm kind of, I'm, like, I'm a toy designer, I've got a headmaster, do you know what I mean? So, so it, it, it's kind of like, so I think 
I had all of this going on in my head. Lego will want this, don't come on this, you need to be yourself. And then I was also, I've, I've never been particularly confident and obviously growing up gay and you you have all of these issues that you've grown up with. And I was like, don't be too gay. And you know, all of these things <laughs> sort of go in, in your head. And yeah. then I did, when I watch it back, I was like, I just felt I was a bit robotic and not really being myself and, and stuff with, uh, it wasn't until like episode four or something that I kind of started relaxing into into what I was doing, and and I can even see that when I watched it with um, Amy and Jamie, is that they were a little bit more guarded and like taking things very seriously to begin with until they sort of let their guard down because you just feel like you've got so many people's expectations on your shoulders that it's like you you need this to be good for everybody, and you also want to be to be. Um, shown in a good light and you you also don't have control over the editing so you don't know what what's going to go in and, yeah. in and out as well so it was daunting but at the same time i think the whole um the whole tone of the show is just generally lovely and caring and creative and i knew ultimately that was the show that we were going for so I'd never be shown in a really, really bad light. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but there were a few, a few things that things I felt were edited that made me look a little bit snippier than I, <laughs> I actually was. Um, and, and of course, then you get reactions as well from the public as well. That it's like I've had so many lovely people come up to me and be like, "Oh my god, the show was amazing!" and you've inspired my kids and things. And then I've had other people, there's been one or two that have come up to me and are like, you, you that Lego man, I want to slap you and whatever. And it's it's just oh. you know, take the, the, the rough with the smooth and things as, yeah. as well. But um, no, generally the whole experience, I, 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 I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I've got to say from my just, and I know you can't really speak to this, but I felt like in general, just, you know, because we looked at all of the, the things people were saying on the internet about the show because you can't help yourself even though you really don't want to. Um, yeah. I felt like um, I felt like Amy and Jamie kind of got a bad rap um, mm. in some cases because, you know, people were like, oh, well, they're so mean and so this and so that. And yeah. I think, you know, and, and I, also, I also think that, um, you know, obviously the... The U.S. version is, I don't want to say more aggressive than the U.K. Mm -hmm. version, but there's definitely more of a, it's more competitive. American right? feel to it, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, it needs to deliver to the audience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I felt like there were, um, and, you know, I came to, to their defense many times, and I was like, well, you're only yeah. seeing what they wanted, like what the show wants you to see. Like, yeah. you didn't see the times where all the nice stuff that they said about what we made, like they just decided, mm -hmm. like I know in one in particular, and we've talked about this before, is our very first build on the show, our Spooky Town um, yeah. uh, theme park, they gushed over it. Like Jamie was like, mm -hmm. that's a ride I'd wanna go on, that looks yeah. great. And the only negative thing they said, the in only thing they said was, it looks, uh, it looks a little blocky and I'd like to see you round some things out. Yeah. And what did they show? When the show yeah. came on, the only thing they showed was mm. it looks a little yeah. blocky, and yeah. and you know they were like, why did they do that to you? And I was like, no, you don't understand. They had yeah. like five minutes of nothing but nice things to say about it. Yeah. Um, and I think as well, it's it's also at, at the same time because I think we all know that we're signing up to a bit of that. And yes, it's not nice hearing not nice things being said about you about yourself, but. At the same time, the show does need to sort of create some suspense. Oh, and sure. Yes. If, if, if everybody is just given lovely feedback and and it kind of needs to be cut in a way so by the end of their episode, people are like, oh, my God, who's it going to be? Who's going to go or whatever? And if, it, if it's been too sort of predictable, then it just takes all of the sort of tension and excitement out of the show as well. So I think we all know that, that that's part and parcel of, of, of what we're doing. Um, and of course, we do want to be perceived as the genuine, lovely people that we are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and honestly, Amy and Jamie are both the most adorable, lovely people. They in, are in agreed as well. And and yes, it was a little bit tough for them, but I think um, if everything goes according to plan and there's a season two, they both really, really want to come back. And, oh and yay! Yeah. yeah. Well, Hopefully everything will fall into place, but um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm super proud of what they did and 
no matter what you decide or how it's edited, some people are going to be happy, some people aren't, yeah. and, 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 and that's, that's just the way it is. But within a few months, everybody will have forgotten about those niggles and just remember the show as a really lovely show in general, and they'll be back to watch it for the following season. So, um, yeah. I got um, I got inklings. Um, Amy and Jamie and Will, all of them were very good about following the rules. You know, there were mm-hmm. rules yeah. for a show, and and they wanted to make sure it was fair for everyone, and no one yeah. was playing favorites. But there was yeah. there was just a couple of times. You know, we would be working behind our build table, and everything sort of hidden from the middle aisle because it's all faced towards us. But yeah. there, there was one time in in one of the episodes where they both came around the table and Amy just got the biggest grin on her face. <laughs> and and um, obviously Jamie was was very happy with what we were doing, but then they saw that we were looking at them and they were like, oh, don't, don't, don't. The, judge, <laughs> the judge face <laughs> came <Yeah>. on. <laughs> but they're fans as well, right? That's And, yeah. and I think in addition to just being so, um, you know, well engineered and all of the other reasons we like Lego, I think it yeah. engenders this feeling of yeah. warmth and and community and creativity. Mm. You know yeah. that that I think, even though and and we had a wonderful wonderful experience on Lego Masters, the the producers wanted us to be competitive because it's a show and it's a competition, but. We're we were all Lego fans who were contestants yeah. on the show, and we come from lugs and and building our stuff and sharing bricks with one another, and we all kind of just fell in love with one another. And I think that's really a testament to Lego that it draws so many people like this to it, you yeah. know, of all ages. Well, and it, it in, I'm always amazed by the uh, the community, especially when I go to conventions and stuff like that. And we've talked about this on the show before. And I mean, even our group that's grown up around this show, like amazing, um, (laughs) amazing group of people who are so willing to just like share information and techniques and, and, you know, places where, you know, you can go to gather and be with like-minded people. And it's just such a great, like, um, sharing, um, it's a sharing thing, right? And even Mm -hmm. on, like, even on Lego Masters, like Richard was saying, we were supposed to be in competition, but... I know, yeah. like, I can remember when, uh, again, that very first one uh, with the theme parks, we all had, there were these beautifully built trees all over, yeah. and most of us took them off. Like, we built our own spooky trees, and then, like, Boone and Mark were doing this Timber Town thing, and everybody gave their trees to them to yeah. use for their piece. And it was just, yeah. it, and that started it off, and we really... Um, we traded we were... pieces all season. Yeah. I, I just felt like, you know, no one wanted to see someone's tower fall over. We all want, no. I mean, we wanted our designs to be the best, but we wanted every, what I said is I wanted everyone to do well and I wanted us to do better. <laughs> Fair enough. That's the right level of competition. <laughs> okay, so. No, but I, I also just want to say to, to you guys as well that it was so nice having a couple like you on on the show as well and sort of representing um our sort of people so i I think that that's been really brilliant just to see such a wholesome lovely caring supportive couple on tv that you don't necessarily get to see very often so um thank you very much for being bold and brave enough to put yourselves out there and it it, it means a lot to a lot of us so thank you very much Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. That is so <laughs> sweet. <to hear>. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, th- thank you. Yeah, we really, um, it was, well, we've gotten amazing fan mail, right, from people who said, I mean, ev- I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm, no, I'm no, sorry. I'm just okay. kind of full of it right now. One of the nicest things we got, like, people responded so positively to our relationship and our support mm. of one another. But one woman um, emailed Flynn, I think, or, or on... Um, I don't know how she got in touch with you, who said that her son suffered from panic attacks. Oh, yeah. And how just just reassuring it was for her son to see that that it was okay and you can recover from it and there, there's no stigma. So just yeah. something that we never even would have thought. Like, people are yeah. looking. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and just the what people have said about building with their families and just it's been amazing just what people have said about their experience with the show. Well, you know, I mean, growing up, 
you know, growing up gay in the 80s, like that wasn't something that I would have I would have ever thought that would happen. And certainly yeah. when, you know, we went to Brick's Cascade, which was the craziest. I can't even believe it. Like everybody who was there collectively was like, this is the craziest convention yeah. I've ever been to. Like it was over the top. And um, I just remember being there and having all of these families come up with their kids and they wanted us to like hug their kids and shake their hand and see, you know, and like, and meet us. And because of course, like our role on Lego Masters a lot was defined by us being a married couple. And that's <laughs> what, I mean, like that's our, that's our team. And to, mm -hmm. to feel, um, you know, accepted by families yeah. and and people with kids because you know back in the day it was like oh don't let your kids <laughs> like you know yeah, yeah. Getting, and it was um it it meant, now it, i now it it's my turn lot, right <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> really, you know it it did and i gotta say it really meant um it really meant a lot to a lot of us that um that lego stepped up and did the um yeah did the pride uh posts this year for yeah. uh, last year for, everyone um, is awesome right yeah the, the everyone is awesome and the and like the the lego heart the rainbow heart it really just it was like seemingly such a small thing but meant yeah. like a huge amount to mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. and i'm sure i'm i'm sure to a lot of people who work for lego like meant yeah. a lot to um, a lot to them too exactly and I, and I think it's just one of those things where we just want to stand up and be a bit more outspoken about stuff like that because it's like, yes, everyone is, is awesome, but everyone has the potential to be even more awesome if they can really be themselves. And I think the more that we can sort of help nudge that along in whatever way we can, then I'm, I'm really proud that we, we, we've done something about it. And, and I think we're going to continue to be um, more outspoken about these things as well. So um, yes, That's... We, we just want... Um, to help sort of push push the world in a direction where everybody's a bit more accepted for exactly who they are and who they want to be, and and then the world will ultimately be a much better place because of it. So, Agreed. Yeah. And you know, and it's one of the things I, I actually wrote about this in one of the articles I wrote um, about you know my experience um, for the brothers on, on for the brothers brick mm -hmm. uh, was that. Not only did I appreciate what Lego's done and in, in being outspoken about stuff like that, but it's also, I think, subtle things that maybe a lot of people wouldn't notice. But the fact that the bride and groom brickheads were released as two separate pieces, yeah. so that people could go and and just buy whichever ones they wanted, was huge. And again, it doesn't yeah. seem like a huge thing, and maybe even the average consumer who goes in to buy that wouldn't even think about that we but, noticed. Uh, but we noticed and a lot of other people <laughs> noticed so yeah i just think that's um i don't know it just really it, that means it means a lot to people and a lot um to feel you know for people to feel represented and there is a very large you know lgbt plus lego fan yeah. community like it's huge mm -hmm. um yeah. so but that was uh yeah well so, that it, while you're while we're talking about this it occurs to me the lego movie one had that message it wasn't an lgbt message but that message of yeah. inclusion and you're the special right yeah. right like, that's so amazing that that's the message that lego wanted to convey like right. that's awesome yes that's that's very so, cool so, I'm, glad, I'm glad we've done a few things that are <laughs> that <are> helping <laughs> so speaking of of uh fun sparkly Gay yes. things. Um, I happen to know that you are a big fan of My Little Pony. Yeah. Now, do you consider yourself a brony, or are you uh, just a fan, an, an adult fan of My Little Pony? <laughs> yes. Well, well, whatever that is. Um, yeah, I, I loved ponies since I was a kid. Was never allowed them myself because they were for girls. And uh, luckily, I had a sister who I became quite instrumental in writing her Christmas wish list. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the baby apple jack. And <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think, and now, um, and like, I think I wasn't allowed one as a kid, I'm guessing, because they were like, I didn't, my parents didn't want me to get bullied for having girls' toys or whatever. I, I don't think they had like a really 
um, big issue about it. My mum also thought they were a bit weird and what to even do with one of those. So she was not <laughs> even that big a fan of having one. So, but now as an adult, I uh, um, is what is known as an extreme herder and rather than hoarder. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes. So most, most people come out of their teenage years and rebel in some ways by turning to drugs and alcohol. And I'm like, screw you, mom, I've got two pounds of my little ponies now. So, uh, <laughs> so my, me and my mom have a wonderful relationship. She's accepting it. She's kind of like, oh God, if I'd only let you had one of those things as a child, this would never have happened. But uh, we, we, have, we have a good relationship, but that is, is part of the appeal is my rebellion. Um, to, to what I wasn't allowed to do as a child. That's so funny. I, uh, my Little Pony is a form of rebellion. I'm all about that. I want to explore <laughs> that some more. Now, the, the ponies have printing on them, right? Yes. On their butts. On their yep. butts, right? And it yeah, makes me think, marks. It makes me think of the accessories in the elf sets. Like any, just like little, like, People go nuts over that that printing, don't they? Well, and it's also mm -hmm. the it also makes me think of Care Bears with their little, you know, that was very yes. it was very eighties, like that was a very it was 80s thing. everything needed a symbol to 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 express what they were about. Exactly, they make it easy for the kids to understand. Yes, which they understand so much more, of course. But yes. um, so and I had I went through my we talked about this actually I went through my my pony phase of uh, back in the early nineties. And I was like yeah. a thrift store hound. And yeah. so all the ones from the 80s were then now at the thrift store with their yeah. like matted hair. And they yeah. would, um, and they would, you could just go and buy like a giant plastic bag full of them for like a dollar. And I would yeah. go and buy them and, you know, fix them up and stuff. And I was telling you that one that I remembered and, you probably remember the name now. I forgot. But it was Spot. hilarious, y'all. I was on Spot. It was hilarious, <laughs> y'all. I was talking with with Matthew online, and I was like, "Oh!" And then there was this one. It was my favorite one. It was like orange, transparent, with like glitter in it. And immediately was like, "Is that uh, '80s or '90s?" So I was like, "I think it was '90s." And like two seconds later, he's like, "Sunspot. Is this the one?" And had, like, <laughs> picture, like you had the whole pony encyclopedia at your yeah. fingertips. I know, but th th this is one of the things I've got so much, like, anything from my childhood, I can recite any Star Wars character, any My Little Pony name or whatever. There's no room left in my brain to retain anything useful as an adult. It's all dumped with kids <laughs> stuff, so, yeah. So I'm curious, did, um, did your love of My Little Pony have any influence on the creation of Unikitty? <laughs> I've, I've actually wondered like uh, uh, wondered about that for a while, and I had wanted to ask you that. So. Yes, there's also another character that may have had a little help from a little inspiration from My Little Pony as well, and I was involved in designing Harlequin for the Lego Batman movie and her uh, um, pigtails. Uh huh. If you yeah. look at Rarity, the unicorn from My Little Pony French Kiss Magic. She has a very similar shaped tail to, to how, how they were sort of created in that spiral effect. So, oh, um, yes, so there's, there's a, a few other, other little things that um, have stuck their way in there. How fun. That's so, wow, that's just, I, that's so cool. I love hearing about, you know, I, like we talked about this before, like, of course, we are here to talk about Lego, but even just on our regular show, we talk about it's far ranging. Like yeah. we end yeah. up on some really crazy subjects, usually about like really old movies or TV shows that we remember. Yeah. You like fall down that nostalgia hole. <laughs> but um, I'm interested in. Um, so you were talking about um, having done your um, your fashion design work on yes. on Barbie dolls. Yeah, that's fascinating. Now, had that uh, had that ever been a collection of yours, or was that just like a means to to an end? I think on and off, I've had a, a few, but I have Baywatch Barbie and <laughs> <laughs> in my, my teens, and the Toy Story one, and and I also had a few Disney dolls and things, Disney princess dolls and stuff, um, and Bratz, and yeah. So I've kind of like. Whenever there's been a toy trend, especially girl stuff, I'm like, oh my god, I love it, and it kind of gets sucked in a bit. And but but Pony has been the the sort of ongoing obsession. So I had actually attempted to get an internship at Mattel um, while I was at university, but that kind of all fell through. So there had been sort of 
inklings of, oh, maybe I could be a toy designer, but do fashion for Barbie or, or whatever. And, um, and yes, and I have actually met one of the lead designers who works for Barbie um, since I've been working at Lego, because we both were on the set of, um, often when we're, we're doing licensed products, we get to, to do set visits and, um, we were both working on products for Batman versus Superman, where Wonder Woman appears for the first time, and he was doing the Wonder Woman dolls at the same time that we were wow. we doing the figures. So we, we, I got to meet Bill Green in his goal. So I got to meet him then. So that was like we were kind of fangirling about each other while everybody else was getting excited about a Batman be also. That's a surreal day. I know. Yeah. And you know what? That actually makes me think of. Oh, actually, first of all, I want to say thank you, Moto, for the super chat. That's and Moto awesome. says, This is such a wonderful interview. Thanks so much for closing out Thursday shows with an epic stream. Thank Aww. you, Moto. Yeah, this is actually our last Thursday broadcasting. We're going to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday because okay. five days was starting to get to be too much. We were doing, we did but seven days for We did seven months. days for a long time. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that was crazy. Uh, but yes, thank you, Moto. And w I, we were just talking about something, and now I've lost my train of thought. This happens sometimes. I get clued in on there, and then I I forgot. am the same. Don't worry. So I actually, shiny, I did have a question. Shiny things. Yes, go ahead. I'm wondering, so we've talked about, you know, you've inspired so many people, and Lego inspires so many people. Who are you inspired by? Like, who are your sort of design idols? Oof. Yeah, design idols, design icons. That's a great question. Um... I don't, I'm just generally inspired by a lot of people. I don't think I'd like, I think Pixar in general has been like so inspiring to, to me just through how beautiful the movies are, are that they create, but also how heartfelt um, the, the messages are. So I think Pixar is probably one of, even though that's not one person, it's, it's, it's sort of collective have, have, have been really really inspiring um just to also be able to bring a sense of joy and a sense of fun but also really really meaningful messages and things through whatever they create and and mm -hmm. sort of the, the 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 messages that they want to get through to kids and families and, and everything is is so beautiful that i think that's where art and emotions have kind of have, have, have hit the right chord um, for me, that I, I think um, that that's yeah. So I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. Obviously, I'm inspired by different things all of the time in in the job that I do. But um, I think Pixar's probably been been one of the big ones. I think that's a great answer. I I've you know I'm I'm constantly re-examining what you know what is good, what is beautiful, all that sort of thing. But to me, um, good art communicates. You know, and yeah. I think Pixar's movies communicate. They're a window on these emotions, you know, mm -hmm. that's accessible. And something I, we think about in our pieces, too, is how do you communicate to a five-year-old and a 90-year-old yeah. who don't even share the same language? Yeah. Like that's, you know, when you talk about how an iconic character needs to just let you know that right from that first view and and it, it seems like you know being able to do that language free is pretty amazing yeah. oh sorry real quick i just wanted to say um and i'm sure the little animation there it is i wanted to thank um minifig nick who is a mutual uh friend oh yes he is. that little troublemaker <laughs> <laughs> yes he says brilliant stream great to see matthew please buy logan some cookies thank you for the super chat we will and and Shane Levan has another super chat and he says I love the Lego movies so much thank you for all your work on the movies and for creating Unikitty. So, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you everybody for the for the super chats. We super appreciate it and it, it definitely um it definitely helps out. And we put that back into the show. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's see if we've got some um Oh, so I guess um I'm just curious uh and I guess now we're kind of going back to the, to the Lego talk, because I realized we forgot this question, so I put it all the way down at the bottom. Um, so you hear the title, Vice President of Design, and of course your your brain just kind of goes, okay, what does that even mean? So what yeah. does that mean, and what is a typical day at on the job? Maybe there's not a typical day on the job, but like, what is a, a general day at, um, on the job like for you? Uh, busy. And, and to be honest, my job title, I'm kind of like, 
it's a bit of a weird job title and I can get embarrassed about it as well. It, it's just, um, so basically, obviously my role is one of the leaders of the design organization at Lego. So that just means that we need to make everything function so the designers can do their jobs and get everything done. Um, but then my tasks are really varied because each of the other leaders of the design organization a sort of assigned a number of franchises. So we've got Nana, who's in charge of mainly Friends and Disney Princess and things. Um, Louise is in charge of um, Creator and the Adult Lines, and Anthony is in charge of our IP related stuff. And then we've got another lady, Cortina, who's in charge of sort of Reality Play, which is is sort of Lego City and minifigure collectibles. So I'm the one that then works right the way across the portfolio in sort of an advisory role to sort of go into each of the, the projects if there's certain things where oh this needs a bit of work or the art direction's not quite what right. So I, I go in and, and work on those to sort of help elevate and and, and sort of um, coach the designers in that project to, to sort of um, get everything within the sets that we need to. And then, so that's part of it, but then there's also um, sort of pitching new ideas to management, coming up with all of that kind of stuff, often working with the agency. We've got an internal agency that do all of our packaging and campaigns and things. So it, it's working with those um, as well. And then there's the script reading of all the movies that are coming in and what we want to team up with. So like every day is completely different. Some days I go into the office and tick all the boxes of this is exactly what I thought I was going to achieve today. Other days I go in and there's a bit of firefighting that needs to be sorted out, that things have popped. It's a bit like whack-a-mole, that one problem pops up here, you sort that one out, and then another one pops up somewhere. So it, it, it's kind of working across um, a lot of things. And then also, um, sort of helping to set the strategic direction of where we want to be going as an organization, what we want to be achieving in the future and, and, and all of that. So um, some admin stuff, a bit of creative stuff, and and then um, and, and then sort of all, all the staffing kind of things as well. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, so I nice. do miss Ooh. being very, very creative. <laughs> uh, all, of, all of that stuff takes away from, from day-to-day -day creativity. So where, whenever I can get my hands on a brick, so we can really get involved with the design team's great. And, and I am actually working on a product at the moment. So I'm building a new set, the biggest yeah. set that I've ever built, which isn't huge. <laughs> <laughs> set that I've, I've designed that's going to be coming out next summer. So, oh, um, that's exciting. Well, we'll definitely be on the lookout for that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I want to say thank you for Christopher Separator Guy Chalice for the for the uh, the five dollar uh, super chat. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, five pounds oh. super chat. Oh. Um, and he says thanks for a great feed. Hello from good old England. It's raining in England for a change. You might like to know, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's he's not raining in Denmark for once. Yay. And, uh, and he's throwing his support behind uh, for a series three of lego masters uk yes <laughs> well it, it must with all of those hats that you wear it must be very yeah. challenging to be present in the moment you know yeah. like do you especially like i'm imagining some of your work with the designers must be not unlike what you do for lego masters right like yeah. you know this is really great storytelling and and we think maybe a different direction here I just, yeah. my hat's off to you for being able to focus on all of those incredibly varied tasks and flying over, yeah. you know, you know, when, when we all flew more flying on your weekends, when you work during the week, it's, yeah. I feel like you're making a difference in something that's making people so happy, making us happy. Oh, uh, speaking of happy, uh, uh, thank you so much, Aubrey yeah. Kovach for the $5 super chat. And Aubrey says this stream has just made me so happy. Thank you, Flitchard. That's a thing. And, <laughs> and Matthew, such inspiration, especially for my kids, nine, six, and four, who also love watching. Oh, thank you awesome. so much, Aubrey. That's, that's so great. We love that. And we love, um, you know, we were telling you early, uh, we were telling you earlier that we do these, um, these build challenges every week. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Mini Fig Chick. Um, uh, and it's a, oh, it's a super sticker this time. Thank you for the super sticker. Um, 
and um, we so but we have a lot of um, of families who actually like send us like we'll get a single email and each person in the family has built something for our build challenge oh. that they all built together. That, that, yeah, that they built together, or they each like built their own. And a lot of times, you know, like I get these notes, and they're always like, "And this is from you know six or from six year old so and so with a little help from dad." Yeah. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I always oh, love that. Super cute. Yeah, but they've um. There's a lot, of, and as a matter of fact, yeah, we have um, the one that this week that we're doing is called Fun in the Sun. And by the way, mm -hmm. everybody, don't forget that your Fun in the Sun um, mocks are due today by 5 p.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time, and you'll send those to Flynn at TrickyBricks.com, and we'll be doing or the, the, or um, the Google form. Oh yeah, or the Google form that I made uh, that you can upload to. There's a link to that in the in the community tab. So if you want to see the community tab, you have to be a subscriber. So please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, um, mm -hmm. and um, join in on our build challenges because they're really a lot of fun. And I'm interested to see. We actually did. A, um, and this was interesting. We did a rebrick challenge last week. So somebody thought yeah. it would be a great idea if everybody got the same set and then people had to build something out of that set. Um, yeah. And so we chose the City Street Sweeper because it's like a nice $10 <laughs> set, easy. And it has crazy pieces, and, um, too. And yeah, you should have seen. We got, like, normally we get between 20 and 25 entries. We got over yeah. 40 entries for this wow. particular one. And the range of of, um, of different imagine. styles and stuff was it was incredible. It was an incredible yeah. challenge. Max and nature scenes and adventure. Yeah, it was um, it was really fun. Lots of mechs. Mechs were very were very popular for that. A one. lot of people love a mech. <laughs> yes. Oh, and you know, actually, that reminds me. I have a feeling you will appreciate this, and not to be a show off, but. <laughs> Oh yeah, we so we did a mech challenge, and I made um, the. Oh, demo I've, 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 I've seen a horn. <laughs> yeah, this one. What was that? Oh yeah, um, the uh, I made one combined Duplo and regular bricks, like a big yellow yes. Duplo one. And Flynn, what did you make? Okay, wait, I gotta put my. He's gonna put, put his my ears headphones back in. Back in. And it's it's not perfect, and it won't. She won't stand on her own. But yes. I did make um I did make a Cinderella. Oh. <laughs> and she is she's in her she's in her tower and i included the glass slipper and the clock and, and everything and she's Barry. actually supposed to be carrying her pumpkin a pumpkin <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious and ridiculous at the same time oh yeah i mean well you know i'm I'm not a very serious person a lot of the time, I, so I I think if, that. if I'm going to have to make a mech, it's going to have to be a fun one. Yeah. <laughs> so we've gotten some really good ones. See, I was wondering, was there anything you wanted to know or something you had on your mind today that you wanted to talk about? Well, my, my mind's a bit blown at the moment. I think... No, no sweat. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm a little bit frazzled, to be honest. Um... No, I'd, I'd just like to maybe get a sense of of what Lego Masters has done for you guys and, and, and how you've sort of felt coming coming out of the other side of it and, and what the experience was like for you. Well, um, so we, we definitely make it a point on this show to, to be very honest with people, um, yes. with our viewers and stuff, and I think that's part of the reason we have such a a good family here is because we are we just try to keep it real as possible well, we, we did that on lego masters as yeah well, right? um, we decided yeah. that early on that we would just sort of lay our cards on the table yeah. and you know it was of course very difficult to being eliminated like that was really yeah. that was really hard and um it was also it was so strange because coming home from that it's as a contestant, you're there one minute, yeah. and then you're gone yeah. the next minute. Yes. Yeah. And it was um, it was an alarming, <laughs> sort of like alarming. <laughs> and you know, you come home, you go to bed, and then you wake up the next day, and you're back at home, and everything's suddenly kind of back to normal like again. Like a dream. Yes. And it made it made it made the whole experience seem like a dream. Like it really. Yeah. Um, and. As much as I enjoyed doing the show and building and being creative and all of that stuff, like the big thing yeah. for me that I took away from it all was not only the experience, but meeting the other contestants and creating our sort of like Lego family was huge yeah. for me. 
Um, yes. You know, we're all still um, in touch, and we keep in touch. Oh, and I see Aaron is in the chat, actually. Hi, Aaron. Hello, Aaron. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think Corey was in it earlier, but he had a different name, so I wasn't sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was... Um, so I took away, I tried to take away from that. And then I, I'll, if I'm being honest, I was really bracing for a lot of homophobic blowback when yeah. the show came on that frankly mm -hmm. never happened. I mean, or at least if it did, I didn't see it. I'm sure it yeah. happened to somewhere, but it never made it to us. Like we had a couple mm -hmm. people come and try to cause trouble here on the show when we first started yeah. it. Um, but now, com you know, coming out the other side of it, I think, and we talked about this earlier, is like we don't actually talk about Lego Masters so much on this show yes. um, just because it's so much about other things. But it, it's also true that Lego Masters created the opportunity for us to have this show yes. and for us to be able to talk to you and to talk to Justin and to talk to, you know, Amy and Jamie and, and all of yes. that. And it was just such yes. a, um, a huge, a huge boon. And mm -hmm. not that boon, the other boon, <laughs> uh, the other kind of boon. Um, it was yeah. just such a, a, a huge boon for us. And I'm, yeah. I still, every day, I'm just amazed when we get emails from people just saying how inspired they were by our work mm -hmm. or um, yeah. that they picked up Lego again because they saw our YouTube show or yeah. um, they had never, you know, we, we give a build challenge and... Um, People are like, I, I really stretch it on this one. I've never built a mech, or I've yeah. never built a, or this is my first mock. This is my first mock, or this is my first vignette. Yeah. So the ability to have that kind of widespread reach to be able to inspire other people to make art is yes. the other huge thing that I take yeah. away from it. Yeah. Absolutely. For me, just other than the fact that it was just so exciting, the whole thing yeah. was was you know the biggest adventure of my lifetime really um it was it was about confidence and trust um yeah. com it, trust in that it was okay while the clock was going to just be like you know what you can do this and this yeah. idea is worthwhile and even if it's not a perfect idea you have the skills necessary to yes. make it happen and also trust in in Flynn i think both in in a sense in our relationship I mean, we have an amazing relationship. We've known one another for 20 years. We're about 30. to... 30 years, excuse <laughs> me. No, it, it's true. Early 90s, we were together for a little over a year. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, ten, almost 10 years ago now, um, we got married. But being able to trust him in an artistic, uh, you know, from a design perspective and a yeah. making it happen perspective on a clock... Like we take months, we take like six months to build our things yeah. was huge because it was a big leap of faith. I mean, we, we, I sort of approach our things from the inside out. I mean, we, we talk about the whole thing and the silhouette and the colors, and then we kind of go to our corners and I think about structure and from the inside out. Yeah. And he thinks about, uh, about finishes and texture and narrative making it look pretty basically <laughs> well <laughs> that's my job all so much of what, <laughs> yeah. so much of what you see on the outside and i just had to trust that he could do that and that i could let yeah. that go while there were all those cameras and we were mic'd all day long so mm -hmm. I, I think it was great for our relationship because it added this whole other level of trust on mm -hmm. top yeah. of the artistic, you know, and personal trust that we already had. Yeah, and then is. just for me personally that, okay, so I don't have the perfect idea right now, but it's okay if I just know this step and maybe a couple more. And, yeah. and it's made such a huge difference, even on this show, like we do our challenges and I'm, I've never made a mech before or, you know, a number of our different challenges. And maybe it's not going to be the coolest thing ever made, but that it's okay to share it. <laughs> that was just huge. It's okay to share it. And yeah. You know, and that's actually, that's, I think we, we brought that to this show because we, uh, like a long time ago, we've done one giveaway. Um, but mm -hmm. um, like a build contest. But yes. then um, we now we've just we've moved to challenges because I feel when you put contest in it, it ma it makes people who maybe aren't as experienced 
feel like they can't compete. Like I'd never be able to make something as good as these people. So why yeah, 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 should yeah, I bother? Yeah. Where I yeah. find the challenges really um, make people want to stretch, especially because they know yeah. we're gonna we're gonna show it and talk about it, and yeah. and they find you know and 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 if that encourages them to build more awesome great stuff that they yeah. wouldn't have thought of before like i just i think we like we reached our goal of like inspiring. oh no but that's amazing that you guys are going on and you're inspiring so many people after the show as well it's it's it's, it's really great thank you very much for doing that uh, well thank you yeah i mean we uh we all wouldn't be here without lego and without you and without all the people who work there and amy and jamie yeah. and justin and all the people that we yeah. know i keep saying the names of people i know because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise i don't know what i'm talking about but you know it's always been to and to have the opportunity i think um i don't know it's not every day that you feel like you can reach out and speak to someone mm -hmm. who is as is high very high reaching in a in a corporate company like i wouldn't think of calling you know like hitting up i don't know the vice president of whatever at some other company over instagram yeah. but you know you you and the rest of the company have made um the way that you make yourselves accessible um to yeah. people i think is is wonderful and and i especially love about your um your twitter and your instagram is that you are being 100% you and you're not mm -hmm. being limited by, you know, a, a company telling you, you have to behave X yeah. way. And um, I think that's really, I think it's really super important. And, important and I stuff. think it, it's really lovely as well, what you were saying about how you kind of created a family with the rest of the Lego Masters contestants as well, because that was one of the things that um, with our show in the UK, there was, um, a couple of guys that like I've got nobody around me who plays with Lego or builds and it's just like no connection to 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 anybody else and now that they're feeling like they're part of a family and, and this is it's kind of normal in a way and it's fun and people with common interests should come together and help each other thrive and things so um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad that, that you've got your, your own Lego Masters family out of this as well. Well, and what's funny is not not only do we have our whoa, not only do we have our Lego Masters family um, from the U.S. show, but people from the Netherlands have reached out to yeah, us. Yeah. We had Maddie and Jimmy from the U.K. or from the Australia yes. show um, on yeah. on on here. Um, they're about yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they're so wonderful. They're like the they're like the mirror universe us. <laughs> um, Richard says he doesn't know if they would agree with that, but we say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so um, it's been that's been really interesting like that being able mm -hmm. to like um that it kind of reaches out beyond and now we are kind of this um th and i think one of the first things i said to everybody backstage at lego masters i was like you know i know that there have been other seasons and other you know and other there will probably be a season two and that there are these things taking place in other countries where they're doing the show yes. but right now at this point in time we are the only 20 people who will ever experience this one thing right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's not a lot of things in the world that you can say that about. Like we no. are the, uh, you know, the only ones to, and then you have to go out and do that experience in front of gazillions of people. <laughs> it turns into something else entirely. But um, yes. Well, it, I'm glad that you, I'm so glad that you felt like it was okay to be, uh, uh, to, uh, that you didn't hide behind a desk, you actually went out and did this show that inspired people. And that, that's the other yeah. thing I was really thinking is, not only do I feel more confident now sharing my work, you know, yeah. um, and, and not just work that I've worked six months on, like here's my idea today, what is mm -hmm. this? But I felt like this whole experience has done that for me personally too, because in a convention setting, we always had a piece between us and everyone who came to the convention. Yes. Right. But like you say on, on your experience with LEGO Masters, people are looking at you as you, as a personality, right. Right? Yeah. as a person, and that was very new. But it makes me feel like, okay, well, I can be Richard the Grey Brick, and people find <laughs> value in that, and I have something to offer, and it's okay to be me. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> oh my goodness.
this. Yeah, I think that was one of the, um, you know, sort of like, well, I don't know, because it's it's difficult because, of course, this whole COVID thing happened right at the end of our run. So, yeah. you know, we would right now, we would be touring around and going to conventions and like being, yeah, you know, yeah. Lego Masters at, at conventions and we did get an opportunity to do that at um, at Bricks Cascade, which I mentioned before mm. was just crazy. I mean, people waited in line for hours to talk to us, yeah. which I was just completely flabbergasted by. Like, I couldn't believe yeah. it. We and kept I apologizing to them, and then I would want to have, like, you know, you meet thousands of people in a day, we did, and I'd want to have a personal connection. Like, to you know, to a five-year-old, well, what did you build today? What do you yes. like to build? Yeah, which always, you know, made the made the lines longer, but darn it, we actually, you know, I didn't just want to be, be like, like okay, here's your signature. take a picture, yeah, go yeah. away, okay, take a picture, go away. And I think what, just sort of building on what Richard was saying is, you know, from the experience of being a builder at a con, again, people's interest is in the model, not you as a person. Yes. Yeah. And then suddenly people were interested in us as people, um, and almost like as builders second, and people yeah. first, so that's that's been strange. <laughs> like... And I'm sure um, I'm sure you probably experienced some of that too. Just going from again, like your job at an office, and then all of a sudden everybody knows who you are, right? You're just sorry, but <laughs> no, it's okay. My, my phone is going. My mum keeps trying to call me. <laughs> I might have to go in a minute. <laughs> so, sorry about this. No, I'm so, sorry. What was that last question? No, I was just saying was that. Um, how was that for you, like, going from being, like, you know, your office job and, you know, I think that probably people who, the average consumer who just goes and buys a set off the shelf doesn't think about all of the people yeah. who maybe worked on it or that, you mm -hmm. know, there are attach a name to it. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly going from that kind of, uh, of thing to suddenly being in the public eye and being, uh, you know, yeah. being a judge and suddenly people are knowing you for you. So I'm sure that yeah. must have been very strange for you, too. Um, it, it was, but obviously, I live in Denmark. The show is on in the UK, so I didn't like while while it was was airing. I wasn't actually home that much while it was on, so it's not like I'm walking down the street all of the time and people are like, oh, there, "There's the Lego Man." Or whatever. So, <laughs> nobody knows what my name is. I'm just the Lego Man. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it has that. Yeah, so it, it, it hasn't really changed that much in in a way. And and to be honest, if people have recognized me, I I could sometimes see people clocking me and then they don't approach me and, and, and stuff as well. So it's and I'm I'm quite happy to chat to anybody who, who wants to say hi and things. But um yes, but I think the experience in general for me has um has just uh, just coming out of the show and sort of seeing the inspiration that it's created with so many people that have kind of had a tub of Lego in their attic or something and not played with it for years. And they're just like, oh, I'm going to get this down and we're going to build something and we're going to try things out and, and families coming together to do that. That's been um, um, sort of um, really, really inspiring to me and has made the whole thing worthwhile. So, yeah, so I, I think... It, yes, my level of fame compared to, to where Jamie and Amy are, it's, it's, it's very different with the exposure of the US show. And in some ways, I'm, I'm actually quite comfortable with that as well. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. yeah. Well, Matthew, thank you so much. We're about to hit the two hour mark. And I know we told you an hour and a half and you graciously said you would stay yeah. longer if it, and we were just kind of going. So yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, um, out to talk with us. And I know that everybody in the chat, like, super appreciated your being yeah. here. Um, and golly, I just, um, thanks for everything that you do and for um, oh. for being an inspiration. We really, we just, oh. we really love that. Thank you so, so much. And, and thank you guys as well. And not only for what you've done on the show, but what you're doing after the show. And this has been super lovely too. So, um, yes, I will get back to phoning my mum back now, so. <laughs> yes, yes, say hello, say hello to mum. Bye, <laughs> Bye. It's just so lovely to have met you, and I look forward to a chance to talk to you sometime again, and, and I look forward exactly. to... Exactly, so, and, and definitely, definitely when, you're, when you're visiting the Lego house as well, of course, we can, we can chat in the meantime 
we we follow that, of course. But but definitely, when you're over in in Finland, then we can catch up. So uh, yes. I look forward. Right. Awesome. Thank, you thank you, Matthew. Bye. Have a great one. Take care. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Joel Marbella, for the for the uh, super chat. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let's see what he had to say. It was all, all back here. Uh, I will have to watch the rest um, after my meeting. Thank you, uh, Flynn and Richard and Matthew, for an awesome and inspiring time. You're what, welcome. What a fun show. Yes. What, what a fun conversation that was. That was amazing. I had so much fun. And thanks for, oh, we can take these out now. Oh, yeah. Thanks, everybody, so <laughs> much um, for joining today and for sending in questions and, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, don't forget, if you're new, please hit that subscribe button. We would love to have some new subscribers, and you can, you can get reminded about when we're doing shows. Uh, this was also our uh, very last Thursday. Yep. Um, starting next week, we will be um, what, taking Monday? Thursdays off. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. Sunday. Yep, yep. That'll be that'll be us. So and yes, like the stream too if you can. Uh, we would appreciate that. And wow, what a an, in, an incredible interview! I'm still just well, kind I'm, of you know we're <laughs> obviously we're huge Lego fans, so I am just a little starstruck right now. And and you know what a just down to earth just just fun person yeah he was a really really good guy all right well everybody thank you so much for joining us today and we will be back tomorrow at 10 a.m sharing your submissions yes sharing your submissions so i expect to see lots of emails in the next few hours from people for our fun in the sun challenge I uh, can't wait to see what y'all come up with. Wow, I guess we have to build ours, too. Eee. Yeah, I, I have a good start on mine. <laughs> oh, yes, don't forget to change our broadcast schedule in the descriptions. We'll definitely do that. Mm -hmm. um, last Thursday's stream went out with thunderous applause. That joke is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I like jokes that are a bit of a stretch. Um, oh, and yes, and, oh, sorry, you can, you may email it if you do not, are not able to use the Google Sheet. If you can use the Google Sheet, please do, because yep. it'll make it so much easier for us. The link to the Google uh, the Google form is in our on the community tab of our YouTube channel. Um, and so I believe you have to be subscribed to be able to see that. I'm not sure, but um, you can definitely. Um, There's a lot of good information there, right? Yeah, I haven't actually checked the form lately, so I don't know if we've gotten. I'm sure we have. But, um, you know, actually, maybe I could. I wonder if I could look at it right now because I'm... No, you know what? If I start typing, it's yeah, going to go crazy know, on the thing. Stuff up. I, will, I will absolutely look at it. And if for some reason, um, Hooded One, if I don't see it, I'll let you know. But um, as far as I know, it should have worked. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Don't forget to stay safe, stay healthy, wash your, your hands, hands, wear a mask, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much, everybody, for a really great last Thursday. What a blast. All right, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Oh, no, it's not working. <laughs>